the economics of the future are somewhat different, we were told. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. It's a bold statement that was thrown out there at various times during Star Trek's run, without any real exploration of the practicalities of how, or indeed if, an advanced society could function without money as an abstract store of value and as a mechanism of exchange between individuals. So, as the writers never saw fit to explore the concept in detail, I thought I would fill in the gaps and find out if humanity's evolution beyond the need for filthy lucre is a realistic prospect. And with that in mind, the first question I think we should ask is, is it even true? Because, let's be clear, in the original Star Trek series, it absolutely wasn't. Uhura was about to hand over ten hard-earned credits for a triple, and even as late as Star Trek III The Search for Spock, we see Dr. McCoy trying to illegally charter a space flight. And what does he say? Price you name, money I got. But then, just one film later, in Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, the crew are transported back in time to 1986, where the normally consummate professionals are made the butt of various fish-out-of-water running gags, one of which is their lack of familiarity with currency-based economics. But, I'd take that one with a pinch of salt, because when I first watched this film as a child, I just took it to mean they don't use physical cash. And incidentally, I don't know about San Francisco, but you couldn't even make the exact change joke in London anymore, because the buses don't accept cash payments. So I can absolutely believe cash would have disappeared entirely by the 23rd century, but whether you think that's a good thing probably depends on your level of trust in governments and financial institutions. No, as far as I can tell, the Federation's evolution into a currency-free utopia, or commie sharefest, whichever you prefer, is more an invention of the next generation era. Part of what the writers called Roddenberry's box, or the rules the series creator imposed on the fictional reality of Star Trek and the interactions between its characters. Or, as veteran Star Trek writer Ronald D. Moore put it in 1997, By the time I joined The Next Generation, Gene had decreed that money most emphatically did not exist in the Federation, nor did credits, and that was that. Personally, I've always felt this was a bunch of hooey, but it was one of the rules, and that's that. He was right, of course. It is a totally implausible fantasy. But as a thought experiment, it's fun to think about why that actually is. A common conceit expressed by fans of the currency-free lifestyle is the idea that technology like the replicator renders physical goods worthless, because without a notion of scarcity, nothing has value. Why earn money to pay for food when everything you need comes out of a magical hole in the wall, right? Well, not quite. Replicated goods aren't exactly worthless. The fact that they are easily replicated just means that, where those goods are fungible, the upper limit of their value is the cost of the energy you need to replicate them. And how much would that be? Well, as it happens, it's not hard to work it out using Einstein's classic formula for energy mass equivalence, E equals mc squared, where E is energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light in a vacuum. So, as is tradition, let's use a banana for scale and work out how much it would cost to replicate one. A typical banana weighs about 120 grams or 0.12 kilograms, so plugging that into the formula gives us 1.078 times 10 to the power of 16 joules, or, to put it another way, a surprisingly big number. Let's assume our replicator runs on good old-fashioned electricity and work out how much that would cost. One joule is about 2.778 times 10 to the power of minus 7 kilowatt hours, and multiplying that by the previous figure comes to, as near as makes no difference, 3 billion kilowatt hours. Now, I live in the UK with some of the most expensive electricity in the developed world, and I currently pay about 23 pence per kilowatt hour. So replicating that banana just cost me 690 million of His Majesty's pound sterling, which is about 891 million freedom tokens. But okay, maybe that's not exactly how the replicator works. Maybe it's not pure energy-to-matter conversion. Perhaps it rearranges and recombines the atomic structure of various base elements, but even then you still have the cost of mining, storing and transporting those raw materials. Oh, and yes, a lot of Star Trek wizardry relies on viable matter-antimatter reactors as a source of energy. And yes, that's a 100% efficient reaction, so replicating a banana would only require the same amount of matter and antimatter to generate the energy required. But, of course, the mechanics of producing and storing antimatter at scale never get fleshed out either, but it's so far beyond our current science and engineering capabilities that we can assume it isn't easy, and therefore not cheap. But either way, let's pretend we can hand-wave all these practical considerations away with sci-fi magic, 
and assume everything you'll ever need can be easily replicated using readily available energy that's too cheap to meter. What would that do to the value of physical goods? Well, earlier, I used the word fungibility, a term you might be familiar with in relation to scammy crypto tokens, but all it really means in relation to a given commodity is that its units are essentially interchangeable with no loss of value or utility. In other words, if I give you one quatlu and you give me one quatlu, we both have one quatlu. It doesn't matter which quatlu is which because they both have exactly the same value. But conversely, there will only ever be one Mona Lisa. I could use my replicator to produce an exact duplicate down to the subatomic level, but it still wouldn't be the Mona Lisa. And the original that was hand-painted by Leonardo da Vinci would still be priceless. We even see this scenario played out in Deep Space Nine episode In the Cards, where Jake Sisko and Nog go on a wacky adventure in pursuit of a rare 1951 baseball card, which Jake wants to acquire at an auction as a gift for his father. Of course, as a Federation citizen, Jake works only to better himself and the rest of humanity, and doesn't need money. So he tries to persuade Nog to give him his. And what does Nog say? Well, if you don't need money, then you certainly don't need mine. This exchange eloquently summarises the problem with the whole concept. I can absolutely believe that scientific advances might reduce the cost of essentials like food, water and medicine to the point that hunger, disease and extreme deprivation are largely eliminated. And of course, that's a good thing. But even if you take care of people's basic physical needs, they would still have wants. And as soon as the thing you want is something that somebody else already has, or even more so, requires that person's labour, you have to give them a reason to supply it. And the best reason is to give them something that they can use to buy the things that they want. The great material continuum, as the Ferengi call it. Lately, I've noticed a trend among certain Star Trek fans, particularly in certain online communities, to fixate on the idea of the Federation as a flawless post-scarcity utopia without money and treat it as far more central to the series than it actually was. In reality, it's something that was wheeled out occasionally in a handful of throwaway lines and virtually played for laughs in Deep Space Nine. So why have some people become so obsessed with it? In many cases, I think they're simply dissatisfied with the way their own lives have turned out, and their main objection to the concept of money is the fact that some people have more of it than they do. But let me be brutally honest about something. If you are the type of person who watches a show like Star Trek, and the message you're taking away from it is to think, hey, I can't wait for the day new technology means I don't have to work for a living and can sit at home all day in my free apartment eating free food from my free replicator watching free holodeck porn, then I would argue that you, sir, are a bigger obstacle to achieving the optimistic Star Trek future than the materialistic capitalists the show was attacking. Because that's the real difference between the societies of the Federation and something distinctly less optimistic like Logan's Run, where the inhabitants of the domed city live a hedonistic lifestyle of plenty, but having no real agency, and never really achieving anything, right up until the moment they walk like sheep into the carousel. But of course, having the ambition to go out and accomplish great things even though you don't have to, isn't the same as having the ability to actually do it. Take for example Dr Bashir's father Richard, a man whose ambition greatly outstrips his ability and has to exaggerate and embellish his meagre achievements to make himself feel like less of a loser than he really is. He worked as a third-class steward on a transport shuttle for a few months, but when he found it wasn't as easy as he thought it would be, and he wasn't getting the recognition and affirmation he thought he deserved, did he persevere? Of course not. And why should he? It's not like his family will be thrown out on the streets and starved to death on 24th century Earth, is it? So he did what most people would do in that situation and simply quit. In other words, the things Federation citizens value and aspire to might have changed, but the talent and the personality traits required to make those things happen really haven't. After all, the Starfleet officers we see on screen are ruthlessly ambitious and also mercilessly competitive. There are no participation trophies at Starfleet Academy, and if you define equality in terms of outcomes – as I suspect a lot of these people do, then even without money, the Federation is a deeply unequal society. After all, not everybody can be a starship captain, partly because there wouldn't be enough starships, but mainly because most people couldn't handle the job if they got it. 
No, the truth is that most of us would, at best, turn out like blue-uniformed Lieutenant Picard in tapestry, taking orders from Captain Zuckerberg and Admiral Bezos. And money or no money, you would resent them for it in exactly the same way you resent your boss or your landlord today. Incidentally, I nearly said Admiral Musk back there, but now I think about it, I could imagine him ending up more like Garth of Izar on Elbert II. Now there's an obscure Star Trek reference to finish on. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Tell me why I'm wrong in the comments, and if by any chance you've enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe for more Psychoanacriticism.